My name is William Arnaz. I use my middle initial because there are several people in my family. My son, my father was a William. Could but you we, spell your name, full name? Arnaz. A-R-N-A-I-Z, like in zebra. Uh, we we'll use our middle initials. I use my middle initial H because we have several family members that are all Williams. There's four generations of us. We, we used our middle names because nobody wanted to be called Junior. <laughs> so everybody has a different middle name. Mm -hmm. uh, I was born in Jamaica, New York, in Queens. Attended high school and grammar school and high school in Queens, New York. Uh, graduated from Jamaica High in 1948. Uh, at that time, my father was a <coughs> Uh, I believe a captain or a, uh, a chief in a fire department of New York City, and uh, we moved out to Windhurst, New York. Uh, I stayed in Jamaica, Queens for a while uh, to finish my high school because I didn't want to make a move and lose too much ground. Uh, when I moved out to Windhurst, I went to the Long Island Agricultural and Technical Institute two years and got a associate's degree in chemistry. Mm. Uh, when was that? In 1948 to 1950. When you were born? No, I was born in uh, 1930. 30? Uh, so right now I'm 81 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, at the, uh, when I moved out to Lindenhurst, uh, I went to, like I said, to college, and then I got a job with the Borden's Milk Company uh, in their uh, laboratory because Borden's does other things besides besides milk. Uh, they manufactured bread and coffee and other products, and I worked in their laboratory down on Canal Street in New York City. And I was, I stayed for about a year. Uh, that must be a good paying job. It wasn't bad at that time. I mean, you know, I, you know, I was able to buy myself a car and, you know, at least have a girlfriend anyway. Uh, but I was getting a little restless and I was just about to quit when <laughs> Uncle Sam drafted me. So uh -huh. at, at least I was able to uh, get the protection where my job would be available to me when I got out. Uh, get out of military service. To get out of military service, because that was part of the guarantees at that time. Uh, oh, that's very but, uh, interesting. But uh, it worked out very good, so I didn't have to quit. I just leave of absence. Uh, took a leave of absence mm -hmm. and went into the service, and that that was in June of nineteen. Uh, rather, September of 1951. 51. 1951. I was exactly 20 years old. I would have been 21 on October 14th of that year, 1951. Were you aware of the history of Korea? Yes. Well, not, not so much of the history of Korea, but, I, you know, I know it was probably uh, occupied by Japan for quite some time, uh, as far as I remember, and, you know, not, you know, not, you know, I don't think I could write a thesis on it, but, you okay. know, I, I knew enough about where I was going. Good. And uh, uh, so at that time we, I was, got my uh, orders to go to Korea. Uh, I went, I went, uh, to Seattle, Washington, and got on a boat there, a small Liberty ship with about 1,500 guys on it. From Seattle? From Seattle to, uh, we went directly to Camp Drake, Japan. I believe that was outskirts of Tokyo, somewhere around there. When did you depart for? Korea? Yeah. Uh, first week from in Seattle? From Seattle, the first week in January of 1952. Two. So I got there about maybe the second week in January of 1952. Uh, when I got to uh, Japan, they, they put us in a, what they call a replacement depot for 
the various units that were in Korea at the time. And uh, usually <laughs> the communications, uh, when you have a communications MOS, which is the military occupational specialty, uh, you usually wind up in a signal battalion or something like that. <laughs> After about one week, uh, three, or, three or four of us that took training together wound up in the 5th Regimental Combat Team. Now, the 5th Regimental Combat Team is a, is a unit that uh, looks like a, it's a, a little bigger than a regiment because we have our own, we had our own artillery, we had our own tank battalion, uh, not a tank battalion, a tank company, we had our own medics, we had our own engineers. Uh, it was like a, a small division. And apparently the, we were used as a stopgap unit. And the first, uh, when I got there, got we, where? To Korea. Where we, did we you ended land? Co I landed in, uh, we got to Korea in Pusan. Pusan. And uh, uh, w the unit was then part of the 25th Division, which is the Tropic Lightning Division. The 5th Combat Team, by the way, came out of uh, Schofield Barracks, Hawaii. Although I never <laughs> got to Hawaii. Uh, it was a, basically uh, came from the Far East, was always in the, in the area there. Uh, it was, uh, we did have quite a few, uh, as a point of interest, we did have quite a few Polynesian kids in the unit. This was Hawaiian boys or Japanese American boys which was quite prevalent in Hawaii at that time. And they were very nice, very very pleasant people, you know, to be near. Uh, I think at that time Hawaii, of course, was a territory. Uh, and uh, when I arrived in Pusan, we were assigned to uh, the 5th Combat Team, and uh, we were part of the 25th Division, and they had just come off the front line and they were replenishing the, the, the you know, the, the, the uh, personnel. And at that time, the headquarters and headquarters company, which I would, was assigned to, uh, was down on Kojido, the island of Kojido, where the prisoner of war yes. were. So we did a little bit of light guard duty at that time, and about uh, we were down there for maybe a little, a little less than a month, maybe a little more than a month. But from what I, I was reassigned, though, instead of as a field wireman, I was reassigned as a as a code clerk and a cryptographer uh, because I, you know, had some amount of education and. Uh, they checked out, and I, be, I got secret security clearance, and uh, I wound up being in the message center for the headquarters and headquarters company of the 5th Regimental Combat Team. Uh, after serving down on Kojido for about a month, little, maybe a little over a month and a half, uh, we were put on LSTs, which is uh, landing crafts, invasion craft, and when we went around from from Kojido up the east coast of Korea, uh, above the 38th parallel line, parallel uh, into the area on the east coast, which was known as the punch bowl. Could you stop there and please share your um, observation experience at Kojido? Were there uh, prisoners in the camp in Kojido? Yes. What could you describe that? The, well, the, uh, the prisoners. Well, we were, we were, unfortunately, I mean, uh, the prisoners, the North Korean prisoners were kept separate. At that time, China had not entered the war. I, well, I think, yes, they did. But they kept the Chinese soldiers, prison soldiers, and the North Korean soldiers separate. And uh, So were there Chinese soldiers? Yes. Prisoners? Yes. Yes. And uh, I have, you know, we never had any contact with them. We were over uh, mostly guarding or participating in whatever they wanted us to do uh, with the uh, 
civilian attorneys, they call them CIs or civilian attorneys, which were, you know, communists who didn't want to, who we want to return. We were, in to we were interned as uh, non-combatants, but uh, you know they they had them uh, in in camps. Mm -hmm. uh, that's about all. Uh, you know they kept to themselves in there. There was How a, did they? There was a few, there was a few times when it was uh, there was a problem. There was one problem that they had later on. We had left by that time where they had. The, Kind of like a, a what do you call it, a uprising or something. Uh, I forgot what the what the circumstances were there, but it was. Can you recall how many were there approximately, and oh, what yeah. was the kind of uh, living conditions and oh, the kind of treatment? They were treated very well. In terms of. In terms of food, clothing. Uh, UN uh, UN people and uh, uh, you know were observers and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, uh, I didn't see any mistreatment of any of the persons. That is myself. I, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, I certainly wouldn't guarantee that some that some problems didn't exist, but. Uh, the facility was well run, you know, I mean, it was encampment tents, they didn't live in barracks or anything like that, but I didn't see any of them starving, that's for sure. Uh, after we left that, we went up to the, the punch bowl area, and that was our, my assignment for the next 10 months. I was up in the punch bowl, either up on the rim, in a co combat situation, or a, towards the rear of the punch bowl. Do you remember uh, the Korean name of that punch bowl? The city around the punch bowl? I don't. I, we, this we for the general audience that who will watch your video. No, the punch bowl is up above the 38th parallel okay. on the east coast. Uh, we landed at Samchok. Samchok, yes. Which is on the east coast, and then we got on trucks and went into the punch bowl area. Good. Uh, the punch bowl that was was on the right side or the eastern side of the Iron Triangle, which was towards our west, which mm -hmm. was where a good bulk of the fighting in Korea took place. I think it's far from the Iron Triangle, the punch bowl, right? Far from. Not that, not that far. Not that far? No. Okay. Uh, we had the, uh, when we entered the punch bowl, we were part of the 25th Division. The 5th Combat Team was assigned to the 25th Division at that time. Uh, we had two other regiments with us. The, I believe it was the 27th and the 35th. And then uh, we were the 3rd Regiment. Uh, U.S. forces always work in a 3-1 type situation. Uh, on our left flank, which is closer to the Triangle, was the Turkish Brigade. How many of them? Do you remember? The Turkish Brigade? Yeah. I don't know how big a force. I think the things that I've read was about a thousand of them. I, th I think a full regiment or a brigade. Uh, how about Canadian? I never ran across any Canadians. Uh, but of course, you know, I, you know, we, we, each division had some some other country units attached to it. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, the, the Turks were probably attached to our area because we were in a, what they call the Tenth Corps area. Uh, I stayed there for nine months up on the front. So line. when you arrived, Samchuk, it was around February of 1952, right? Uh, up in, yes. Yeah. It was, uh, well, the end of January because it was bitter cold. I mean, we had uh, we had temperatures up around minus 30, minus 40 below. You, if you took your gloves off, you'd uh, probably, <laughs> your fingers might fall off or something. But we were pretty well clothed. And uh, at that time, uh, in the rear area, when we came off the front for a spell, uh, and we were back on the backside of the punch bowl, uh, 
uh, we, we lived in tents. Up on the rim, we lived in bunkers that were built on the back slope of the front rim. It was, uh, the punch bowl is almost like a, like a football stadium. It's got a, you know, it's, it's around just like a, like a bowl. And there's a front end of the bowl that was up to the north, and the south end of the bowl was where you got out if you had, if you had to. And of course, the front rim was the one where the, the main line of resistance was. I spent all of that winter, the 52 winter, all of that summer, and then in 53 I spent the other winter up there. <laughs> and uh, after, uh, uh, in February of 53, I got, I learned that I had enough points, because you were on a point system, you gained four points for every combat month that you were up there. So I wound up with my 36 points, which probably you've heard of. And uh, I was told that I was ready to go home. So I, <laughs> at, uh, I, I believe it was the end of, uh, maybe middle of March, I was uh, told that I was going to be sent home and uh, my tour of duty over in Korea was over. Could you describe your typical day of uh your mission in the punch bowl. Oh, sure. And any combat that you really engaged, could you describe those things? Sure. Uh, well, uh, of course, you know, we all carried, uh, uh, most of us carried, a, not, not a sidearm, but most of us carried a, a, a rifle, but we carried carbines instead of the heavy, heavy duty uh, M1? M1s, because, uh, uh, the bulk of our work was to, you know, run around the different areas, delivering messages, and going to rear areas, picking up uh, uh, packets that were uh, that that gave unit orders. Okay, we had a radio section, we had the message center sections, which I was part of. We had the field wire section. That, that was pretty much the whole communication section. We had a whole platoon, I would guess, about maybe 20, 30 guys. Uh, in our unit, we had, uh, I think it was about eight of us. So, you know, some of us were better drivers than others, so we did that. Uh, you know, we had several, several times that we were under pretty heavy fire. There's times when we had to vacate some of our, uh, our uh, even our bunkers were starting to <laughs> fall apart and we had to rebuild them. I remember one time I was very lucky, uh, towards the rear of the punch bowl they had the, uh, what they call a, a, where you took showers and that, like a, and a commissary and that where you, got changes of clothes and stuff like that. And the one time that it was shut down for some reason, the, either the pipes froze or whatever it was, and normally there'd be maybe 150 guys taking showers there. Uh, the uh, North Koreans uh, did what they call a blanket firing mission, and they just raked the whole area and blew the whole thing apart. And, uh, you know, fortunately no one was in there, maybe one or two guys that doing some maintenance work. But they could have they could have caused a lot of damage that particular day if everybody was doing what they <laughs> normally do, take showers and change their clothes. Uh, at any rate, you know, to, to go further, you know, I left in the end of February or early March of 53. That was about three months before the, you know, the armistice. And uh, I went back, to, they sent me back down to Pusan, got on a boat, we went over to, uh, but this time, instead of going over on a small Liberty 
getting on a Liberty ship like I did when I went. Uh, I went on, I went home on a General William Weagle, which was probably one of the second or third biggest transport ships in the in the military sea transportation service. And uh, we had about just short of well, a little over four thousand guys on there. And you, you, you know, you could you didn't bump into anybody for maybe fifteen to twenty feet. Going over, we were stepping on each other. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was fifteen hundred guys on a Liberty ship. A Liberty ship. I mean, it's, it's, it's a so tiny, he wasn't luxurious. <laughs> it was uh, this one was luxury. <laughs> but my experience coming home was the one, most memorable, other than you know, staying certainly staying alive during the combat situation. But coming home, they put us on this General Weagle, and at the time, uh, uh, we didn't re realize it, but they were sending home uh, the whole Colombian, uh, I believe Colombia had a regiment of Colombian troops from South America, and they, were, they got loaded onto the boat, and we also had the, the 65th Regiment out of uh, uh, Fort Buchanan in Puerto Rico. So the boat, <laughs> when we left Japan, we went down to Balboa, Panama, which was the western entrance to the Panama Canal. We went through the Panama Canal, we went down to Cartagena, South America, and we dropped off uh, the thousand Colombian troops that we had aboard. And that was very interesting because, uh, you know, some of these Colombian troops were, you know, they looked like indigenous people that, you know, come out of the jungles, so to speak. And uh, after that, we went down to, uh, we left Cartagena. We, we weren't allowed off in Cartagena. We were allowed off the boat in Balboa. But, you know, we spent overnight at Balboa. Then we went up to Puerto Rico and dropped off the, the 65th Regiment of the, uh, from Fort Buchanan in Puerto Rico, which was part of the 3rd Division. I believe they were the regiment of the 3rd Infantry Division. Wording in your service. Well, I, I, the, uh, there was a time there when we all got alerted that there was going to be a, 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 a mass attempt to overrun the punch bowl. And uh, the whole unit was alerted. And uh, uh, of course, at that, at that time, you become almost like a foot soldier, so to speak. I mean, I'm not, uh, I was assigned to a, a, a self propelled vehicle with uh, quad 50s on it. And, uh, what is that? With quad 50 caliber machine guns. Okay. It's, uh, you see them in the, you know, the books. Uh, and, uh, you know, we had all, all the personnel on, on a heavy alert because it, it, it was uh, really uh, at a time when it looked like the war was kind of gearing down, but they wanted to make a last push, right? Uh, at least that's what most of us figured. At any rate, uh, it was a 54-hour siege. Most of us didn't get much sleep. We were sleeping it in the vehicles, and uh, the weather was, it, this was in the winter, the last winter I spent there, which would have been uh, probably February of 53. And it was extremely cold, and uh, you know, it was 54 hours of pins and needles, so to speak. Uh, but it wound up as merely a regular little, just a little skirmish, and you know, not, nothing developed. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess maybe they got wind that we were pretty well prepared. Mm -hmm. uh, that basically was. Most of the time, most of the time, 
that we were in a punch bowl, uh, our, our front units were doing, uh, uh, you know, skirmishes up the line, grab a few prisoners if they could, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, there was no, no major battles, mm -hmm. but uh, certainly plenty of skirmishes. We had continual shelling. I mean, uh, you know, we were shelled every other day, you know, so that you were, you'd have to get in your bunker and either sit it out and hope that nothing, <laughs> nothing happens. Mm -hmm. Any rewarding experience? Rewarding experience, uh, yeah. I, I I would say that uh, we would we were certainly well equipped. I mean, uh, we we when we first went over, we were uh, there was a little bit of a equipment problem, I suppose. But by the time I left, we had plenty of clothes. We were wearing Eskimo parkers. We were certainly in the winter time very well, very well, you know, warm. We had these Mickey Mouse boots that they called them, which were insulated boots. In fact, they were so warm if you didn't take them off and let your feet breathe, you'd probably rot your feet. <laughs> but uh, uh, the food, we, were, we, we had one hot meal a day that was, round, uh, you know, was sent up in uh, either, if we were in the rear area, of course, you ate in, 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 in the commissary. What was your but favorite menu, and what do you mean by hot meal? A hot meal was, uh, you know, was a soup or some kind of stew or, you know, whatever. We had, most of the, the, the cooks were not that bad, <laughs> considering. American you know, cook or Korean cook? Uh, I guess they, I think the, 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 the the kitchens were run by American cooks, but they did have a lot of Katusa personnel, huh. you know, Koreans attached to the U.S. Sure. How would you assess the impact of your service during the Korean War in your normal life after your return from Korea? What, is, what kind of impacts can you think of? I, I uh, you know, I was just glad that I was home. I mean, of course, you, alive. you know, <laughs> alive. Without any wounds. Without any wounds. Uh, uh, I didn't feel, I didn't have any problem remembering parts of it. Uh, you know, I never had any nightmares or anything like oh, that. Good, uh, good. <laughs> you know, but. Uh, uh, I went right back. Uh, <clears throat> in fact, uh, what, in my earlier conversation, I, I said that uh, you know, yeah, you were I, I was drafted to... just about when I was ready to quit my job. Right. <laughs> so when I came back, I uh, it was about in April, and I was reassigned back into at Camp Kilmer. Same same company. S same same place that I went in. Uh, you didn't have any trouble back in. No, and and then. Uh, uh, in April, I was sent home for a week or so, and uh, I, I didn't want to go back to my old job, so I sought new employment, and I went to the New York State Department of Transportation out in Babylon, New York, and I, I told them, look, I just got out of the Army, uh, you know, you got anything open, I'll get out, and I was told them I was going to be separated in, uh, in, in uh, April. Uh, rather in June, and they looked at my, uh, uh, you know, my resume, and they had, you know, they said, uh, you know, well, we'll hire you. When do you want to start? So I got I got out of the army in uh, June of 12th, I think it was, and I started work for the Department of Transportation. Uh, at that time, it was called the Highway Department. Uh, on the 16th. So uh, that was my big fear mm. about, you know, maybe just hanging around and not doing anything for the, too many, you know, months, like some guys get into a rut like that. But I went right back to work. That's good. And I went, from there I went back to school, 
What school did you go? I went to Brooklyn Polytech, uh, Polytechnic Institute, and uh, I came out with a Bachelor of Civil Engineering degree. And I worked for the state of New York for 39 years as a civil engineer. I got my professional engineer's license in uh, 1968. Uh, no, 68 is when I graduated. I did most of the work at night. Uh, I became a professional engineer in 1972. Spent 39 years with the state of New York and retired in 1992. I kept my consulting engineering business going for a little, little more, maybe about eight years more, and then I quit entirely. I went to school under the GI Bill, which I thought was very nice. Uh, to you witness that such a rapid economic development and substantive democracy established in Korea. What do you feel about it? Oh, I feel very proud that I was part of something that uh, turned out good. <laughs> very, uh, you know. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm only disappointed that we, you know, the, the peninsula is still separated. Of course, uh, I don't think anybody likes that idea. Mm -hmm. Because, the, it's a, you know, apparently the Northern regime is not very well liked. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think it's even liked by the South Koreans that much. Although Next year, 2013, we're going to celebrate 60th anniversary of Korean armistice. Right. Isn't this ridiculous? It's ridiculous. It's. And if there is a. I mean, we're, uh, actually, we're still at war. Yeah, technically, we are at war, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know, I, I, could never, I could never understand that, but, you know. So, if there is a petition arguing that enough is enough, even though there are still a lot of problems to be resolved, but from our side, especially from the Korean War veterans who actually fought there, and saying enough is enough, and let's replace peace treaty, from symbolic gesture and symbolic perspective, if there is a petition like that, would you be willing to sign it? I, I, I think I would have to research it a little, see, you know, see what, see what. No, I, I don't think I would do it, cut block. I'd have to. What will be the things that you will consider it? Well, what, 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 what would. What would, what would be the outcome of it? Any message to the young generation from your own experience serving in the Korean War? Or sort of general message about the lessons of the war in other areas? Oh, uh, I, I, myself, I, I feel Any war is, there's no such thing as a good war. I've always said that. My brother did two terms in Vietnam. Uh, he's seven years younger than me. He spent 26 years in the Air Force. Uh, and, the, the, you know, when he came home, uh, you know, the, Viet, uh, you know the, Viet, the soldiers that fought in Vietnam were not treated. We, we weren't treated bad, we weren't treated good, but, you know, it was love's a forgotten war, right? I mean, uh, it just so happens that I happen to hit a, a pretty good... But Vietnam War country. never be considered as forgotten war. Yeah. While Korean War has been yeah. known for Korea, uh, forgotten <laughs> war. But uh, uh, my basic premise is that, the, you know, no war is a good war. War is the ultimate uh, foreign policy. In other words, don't go to war if you don't want to win a war. You know, uh, I, th I think we sometimes we get ourselves into pickles there. To, you know, there, there was a mission with the Korean War. There was probably a mission with the Vietnam War, but some of these other wars coming along now that you know, they, the rules of engagement are much different and. Uh, yeah, I feel for the guy.